And there we go. There's a lovely voice. Um, and I will formally start this conversation. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Andre Nata. Um, I am the pro product, uh, I get tongue tied. I'm the product outreach manager for Muckrock, uh, focused on Document Cloud. And it is a privilege and an honor to invite you to the first case study conversation of 2023. Um, Get everybody, I, and I'm grateful everyone's introducing themselves in the chat. Um, this is a conversation with Jeremy Singer Vine, who is the creator of the Data Liberation Project. And we're going to dive in in a few seconds and have him quickly introduce himself. Um, and then we're at some point, I just want to let you all know that about 30, 35 minutes in, we're going to open up the floor for questions. Um, if you would go ahead and use the chat box um, in your interface of choice to go ahead and submit those questions. Um, otherwise, you can always use the hand emoji. Sonia from the team, our open source fellow, is going to keep an eye on that for me so we can know who to call on at that point. And thank you in advance for asking those questions. Um, and with that, I will say, Jeremy, would you please introduce yourself to everybody? Sure. Thank you for having me. My name is Jeremy Singervine. And yeah, I'm running the Data Liberation Project, a, a new initiative which we can talk about more. Before that, I was the data editor at BuzzFeed News for almost eight years um, and worked as an investigative data reporter before that. Oh, and I'm based in Brooklyn, New York. I was going to say, yeah, don't leave out where you're based, because this is a pretty incredible group of people gathered in the room right now. Um, I say we just dive in, because the first question I want to ask you is, what is the Data Liberation Project, and why the Data sure. Liberation Project? Yeah, and maybe now's the time should I start sharing my screen? Uh, yes. Not that this is the most visually... Uh, illuminating part, but this is the data liberation project. This is its homepage. I'll tell you literally what it is, which is it's an initiative that I launched in September to identify, obtain, reformat, clean, document, publish, and disseminate government data sets of public interest. So that is sort of the, uh, the literal sense of what the data liberation project is, the spiritual uh, identity of the data liberation projects was I spent, you know, 10, 12 years working as a sort of data reporter, data journalist, however you want to put it. Um, thinking about what data sets could do for me for the specific stories and newsrooms I was working for. And it worked. It's a tried and true method. Um, we used FOIA, we used web scraping, we used sourcing. Uh, but at the back of my head, there's always scratching a sort of thought, which is that it felt uh, sometimes very uh, dissatisfying to put all this effort into finding data sets to, you know, sometimes months and months of work just to understanding them and cleaning them. And then, although we prided ourselves at BuzzFeed News about being very transparent and open. We published a lot of our data sets. We published a lot of the code behind our projects. Um, what we published was ultimately just what would back up the particular project we were working on. Sometimes we did bigger data releases, but really our remit, our focus, understandably, was on the stories we were publishing. And so for a long time, I've been thinking, um, how could it be different? What what would it look like to instead think about pursuing government data for sort of the greatest possible public interest good rather than you know, my most immediate uh, professional needs? And that is sort of the, the inkling, the seed of the Data Liberation Project, trying to understand what would that mean? That is very helpful in terms of setting the stage, because as part of the project, you did you were one of the inaugural recipients of the uh, Gateway Grant, um, and could you so could you go ahead and describe that project? And uh, sure, absolutely. Um, 
so yeah, and thank you for that. Uh, I've enjoyed working on the project so far. Um, as a, a little bit of background, uh, you know, I see with the Data Liberation Project kind of two main avenues of obtaining data if you then want to make it all public. So kind of secretive confidential sourcing, theoretically possible, but hard to republish. Really, the main uh, kind of branches are FOIA uh, or relevant state public records laws and web scraping. And this is a it is a web scraping project. It's also sort of a data pipeline project. And it all started when I was reading this article in the New York Times um, about how sort of FEMA was failing uh, at its job post-disaster, um, especially with regards to housing. Um, it's a great article. It's worth reading. But what really caught my eye uh, was this chart by... Uh, by Mira Rujinasaku, um, who obtained, at the time I didn't know how, uh, the number of people still in what they call direct housing, which is you know, most typically trailers, um, for each government declared or FEMA declared disaster. Um, and you can see they have it for Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Florence, uh, Michael Laura, in Ida, um, and you see a sort of pattern, you know, a rise in people uh, obtaining or, or households living in direct FEMA direct housing, and then a gradual tapering off. But part of the point of this was that uh, even after the direct housing phase of the response was supposed to be over, there's still people who need and are in direct housing. In any case, you know, a, I anytime I see data I hadn't haven't seen before, I try to figure out where it came from. This caught my eye. I hadn't really seen data like this before. I got in touch with Mira, um, and she said it was actually a huge headache that FEMA, strictly speaking, doesn't really publish a data set of this information. Instead, what they do is they publish um, something called a daily operations briefing. Uh, and they send this out. They don't publish the briefings um, online anywhere. Instead, they send it to a free and publicly, you know, there's no restrictions on access, but a listserv. Um, once a day, they send out basically a slide deck, which is really just a PDF, uh, and it contains a whole bunch of stuff. Um, it's their sort of summary of, you know, what's going on FEMA-wise and disaster-wise that day, things they're looking out for, forecasts, and so on. Um, they have all these different tables. The tables actually ch change from uh, from day to day. Um, they're on different cadences. One of them is a table, and I should have pulled up one that I knew had it, but it's a table of these counts by disaster. Um, and so Mira said she, she just put a ton of work into gathering them. So even though the uh, the PDFs are only sent out via email, an organization called the Disaster Center has sort of aggregated them. Um, let's try to find it on this very uh, idiosyncratic but helpful website. Let's see, disaster. Uh, What do they call it on here? It has a slightly different name on here. Um, maybe I can just find it. There we go. Situation reports, they call it. And so you can see all these. Uh, oops, some exist, some don't. There we go. Anyway, she went through all of these and uh, through a combination of programmatic and hand uh, parsing, pulled out all the relevant numbers. Um, but, you know, it, the sort of situation I was describing before, she was doing it for this particular story, this investigation, this chart, not really for creating a, you know, a long-term sustainable data set. And so I thought, you know, as part of the data liberation project, that would be a service I'd be interested in providing, that if we could set up a programmatic kind of, you know, 99 point whatever percent automated pipeline to pull in these disaster or these situation reports to parse out 
the relevant information from them, turn it into a data set. That would be something um, that I think would be helpful. Uh, at the same time, you know, Document Cloud is, I'm not just saying this because I'm here, one of my favorite services, uh, and could theoretically enable a whole nother way of interacting with these reports. Right now, there's no way to do like a full text search across uh, every daily situation report. Um, there's also, you know, if you want to link to a particular section of one, there are all sorts of things that just the PDFs existing don't enable, but putting them into document cloud would. So in my mind, I had this sort of data pipeline. We intercept or we receive the, uh, the FEMA email. We find the PDF. We download it, we upload it to Document Cloud, we identify the relevant data in it, parse it out, save it to a, uh, a data set. So that is sort of, I wouldn't say quite so succinctly, but somewhat succinctly uh, the project. And I can go through some of the parts that I've already finished and some of the parts that remain to be done. Oh, cool. I think your, I think your, your explanation might answer this first question, um, but is the data liberation project U.S. only? Oh, uh, very good question. Um, uh, philosophically, not necessarily. I don't see any reason for it only to focus on the U.S. Practically, that's where most of my expertise lies. That's where most of my experience lies. I'm infinitely more familiar with the federal FOIA law than any other country's uh, freedom of information uh, access routine. Um, so for practical purposes, currently it is. In theory, I think it would be fantastic to expand it beyond the U.S. borders. Cool. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and actually, it kind of relates to the obvious question that's next, which is, um, so you just described a very in-depth process. Um, so I know that you've been working on an add-on for use for the project. Could you go ahead and explain um, how the add-on works uh, and what functionality it helps provide? And sure, yeah. Um, in part of my interest in applying for this grant in the first place was I was aware of the add-ons, um, but hadn't really ever tried making one and felt like this would be a good opportunity to do it both you know, and have someone hold me accountable to doing it, uh, and also to kind of have some institutional support uh, for doing it. So maybe for people who aren't um, like instantly familiar with add-ons, they, they are basically additional functionality you can add on to Document Cloud um, by writing a little bit of code. Um, the code is all hosted on GitHub. There, It depends on GitHub's own kind of... Um, computing infrastructure to run, which is clever, but also, you know, sort of a complication or a architectural arrangement that you have to be aware of as you're building them. Um, but effectively, add-on, Document Cloud's add-on infrastructure makes it easier to add little bits of functionality to Document Cloud. And I think they, you know, the Muckrock and Document Cloud have published some examples, I won't go over the things that are possible. I'll just talk about the one I built. Um, so I realized that uh, the first step in a way of this pipeline was going to be kind of a tricky one. Um, FEMA sends this uh, daily operations briefing to your email address to an email address you register with. Um, but I certainly didn't want it going to like my personal email address just because it's a mess. Um, but also I don't have a great way of programmatically accessing it without giving some program access to like everything I've ever emailed, uh, which also I didn't want to do. Um, but there is this cool service called Kill thenewsletter.com, very provocatively titled. Let's see if it'll pop up. Um, maybe having a little trouble loading down. In any case, what it lets you do is generate a uh, sort of, uh, there you go, um, an email inbox that is unique to a particular 
some often it's a newsletter, the idea here, but any kind of stream of emails you plan to receive, you give that kind of custom email address to whatever your registration system uh, the emails use, and then you get an RSS feed of everything that's sent to that inbox, which is great. In some ways, that totally solves the problem, um, which is that you know I was able to sign up for FEMA, uh, these FEMA emails with this kind of custom email address, and then I had an RSS feed of those emails. Um, the next step, though, was how do you go from the RSS feed, let's see, uh, to Document Cloud, or to just even accessing uh, the files. And I realized here is where a Document Cloud add-on would be hidden. So you know, this, this one step I have open here is sort of the infrastructure um, to make this RSS feed publicly available publicly accessible online. And you can, if you can see it in my uh, browser window, you can copy down the email or, you know, we'll find a way to send it out later. Um, sorry, you can copy down the URL. Uh, but then the next step was to get onto Document Cloud, to go from RSS feed of PDFs to Document Cloud or to uploading those PDFs to Document Cloud. And I realized as I was kind of grappling with this, that could be a useful a use case for an add-on, which is I'm probably not the only person in the world who has an RSS feed of documents, let's say PDFs, um, that they want automatically up to, uploaded into Document Cloud. So this is the, the add-on I wrote. Um, I can actually go through it pretty quick. You'll see uh, just how relatively little code it requires, but it's just a... Um, it's a GitHub repository with a configuration file and one main Python file. There's some other kind of uh, small bits and pieces, but those are the main things. The configuration um, is basically the how you want the um, kind of configuration panel to appear on Document Cloud. Uh, Jeremy, you know, can I can I, can I, can yeah, I stop please. you one second? And just for one bit of clarification, yeah. could you explain what an RSS feed is? Oh, yeah, you yeah. I got way like cart before the horse. Um, RSS feed is a now relatively ancient piece of, uh, let's say, web technology. It stands for really simple syndication. And it is an attempt to make it easy to construct a list of, say, entries, which initially were thought of as like blog posts for uh, a blog, later became the sort of underlying infrastructure for podcasts. Every podcast is in a sense an RSS feed with every episode being an entry, but really you can throw whatever you want into those, um, into those entries. The idea basically being that, you know, that they're chronologically ordered and they each have a sort of unique ID. And so in this case, the feed is uh, composed of one entry per email uh, I received from FEMA, reconstructed a little bit so that the there's a sort of link attribute so that the link attribute is pointing to the PDF they're sharing. Does that clarify things? I think so. Thank you very much for doing that. No problem. Um, so you have this configuration file for your add-on, which sort of yeah, it describes the interface you want people or yourself to see within Document Cloud. Um, you know, there's that you can give it your feed a name. You can design uh, assign the URL where it'll be fetching from. You say what project. In this case, this is the configuration I've added for mine. The project, the Document Cloud project, you'd like the files to be uploaded to. The access level, you'd like them to be uploaded as private organization level or public. Um, a source line, if you want to add that to uh, your uploads. And then um, here's a, like a little checkbox for whether you want to be notified when new documents come in, which I do and find very helpful. Helped me diagnose a little problem uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so that is what the configuration looks like. That's all, it's YAML, which is a kind of um, lightweight 
markup language, but doesn't require any real programming knowledge. The part that does require some programming knowledge is the little the Python script you write. Um, part of the sell, I think you can correct me, of Document Cloud add-ons is they make the authentication um, with Document Cloud easy. You don't really, you no longer have to worry about like setting up your username and your password. You connect your GitHub account to uh, Document Cloud if you're running it yourself or you use kind of a muckrock hosted one. Um, in any case, uh, it's really, you know, to me, not that many, not too many lines of code. It basically is just a little plumbing between the RSS feed and Document Cloud. It basically says for every entry, every PDF that you see in this uh, RSS feed, have we seen it before? If we haven't seen it before, upload it to Document Cloud. Kind of boom, boom, done. Um, so on the one hand, not terribly complicated. You could probably write that code uh, in a different way, not using add-ons, but add-ons make everything like a little bit more structured, a little bit more um, cookie cutter in a good way. Um, you don't have to, in this case, rewrite everything every time you want to say work with a new RSS feed or um, to copy the project over. It's sort of uh, a nice little tidy uh, project structure. So that that's um, the sort of maybe too technical, overly technical description. Um, I can tell you, actually, Andre, why don't you ask if you have any questions? I, I could go on I, otherwise. Well, I think I got a, I got a two-parter that probably yeah. helps for some clarification. Um, how much experience do you have writing code? Are you, would you consider yourself a programmer? Yeah, I mean, I'm for, I don't want to say like this is accessible and available to everyone in the sense of you can all write your own add-ons um, because you do need to know some computer programming. I would say... You don't need to know a ton. You don't have to feel like a confident computer programmer. One of the nice things about the add-on is there are already some sort of templates you can use from MuckRock. Um, the code isn't terribly uh, com complex, I don't think. I mean, in most cases, you, you don't have to be kind of inventing new architectures, but you have to um, at least have some familiarity. I think right now, you can correct me, with Python, there are no other options at the moment. Um, Python is the easiest way to go about doing okay. it right now. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, I I've been programming most almost uh, entirely related to news and work. Um, so not as like a you know tech employee or uh, kind of computer science graduate or anything like that. But you know, I would say utilitarian programming for twelve years now. So. Following up on that, then, what would you, someone with your experience, what was, what was, what was, what was hard about building the add-on? Yeah, um, the hard thing right now is there isn't a ton of documentation about how they work or best practices. I know Document Cloud and MuckRock are working on that, and I think that'll definitely, that'll um, speed up the, uh, the adoption of add-ons um, and related to that, I think the hard part was really understanding the architecture behind the scenes, not, not what you're writing, not the code, but really like how it's interacting with GitHub, how it's interacting with Document Cloud, um, how Document Cloud's interacting with GitHub. It, um, you know, I think MuckRock made a very clever decision or Document Cloud. Would you say this is MuckRock or Document Cloud, Andre? I would say it's document. Well, document. It's, it is document cloud, <laughs> part of the Muckrock okay. Foundation. Yeah. Okay. okay. Document cloud. Uh, I mean, I don't know the whole history behind add-ons, but it seems like had a very clever and smart realization, which is now that GitHub has sort of made in a in a grand way small but accessible amounts of computing um, available, kind of for free in many cases to anyone with an account that there were all sorts of kind of new let's call it like democratized ways you could run code um in relation to document cloud um so that that 
on the one hand is clever, but I think the cleverness also kind of contains within it some uh, complexity necessarily. And wrapping my head around that took, you know, a little while. Um, and I think the documentation that's forthcoming will help with that. Yes, I, I think it will. And we do, and we will make a point of when we post the video and share additional notes from the session. Um, we do have links to videos that guide you through approaching the add-on process. In addition to, I believe, Sonia may have already shared some of the links um, in the chat, but we do also have um, some, some articles that are already up related to how to approach developing and, and, and writing add-ons. Um, and it is a part of an ongoing effort to go ahead and make sure as much documentation is available as possible. Um, I think it's also safe to say that as more people start developing, I think they will help feed um, the knowledge base. Um, Absolutely, and, yeah. yeah. So, but no, that is that, that, thank you for answering that question. I think that's an important question to, to go ahead and make sure that we tackle. Um, let me see. Then actually, and I, this is this is my last question that I currently have prepared for, for, for Jeremy. And afterwards, if there are any other questions that I should be posing, put them in the chat or once we, uh, or we'll look for raised hands and things like that, but just um, we'll go ahead and tackle that. Um, this is still a work in progress. Um, so I don't know if you have any examples of people that are currently doing anything with the, with the pipeline that you've created, that, that data pipeline. But um, do you want to talk about, one, are there folks currently doing work with it? And if not, what you think is possible using that data set as a result? Sure, yeah. Uh, right now, there aren't because the, you know, there hasn't been much of a, quote, data release. You know, I'm the pipeline is working. It's uploading these documents to Document Cloud. If you want, you can take advantage of that. Um, I will share a link to... Uh, the repository where those are getting uploaded. Uh, let's see, document cloud. You know, it's all public. Um, put this in the chat. Uh, so, you know, if you want, you can, you know, one immediate thing is you could uh, search for phrases or whatever that might show up in um, these reports. Uh, it's something you couldn't quite so easily do before. You could also subscribe to the RSS feed if you do want to be notified, if you want to subscribe to a feed of the new PDFs. Um, but I think the, the, the quote, real data is still forthcoming. Um, I'm working on the parser that takes the PDFs and extracts the specific direct housing information uh, it's coming along and, you know, once there's a kind of initially useful version, even if it's not 100% complete, that'll be public on GitHub. Um, and I'm hoping people find lots of uses for it. My, on the one hand, it's a simple data set. It's, you know, there aren't a ton of variables. It's like the disaster, the date, and the number of people in direct housing, um, and maybe the date that FEMA announce that number. Um, so on the one hand, to me, it's a kind of good use case, especially for the data liberation project, which is how do you take a data set and make it maximally useful to people? And so I think there are lots of ways. Um, one will be just publishing the data set and letting people do whatever they want with it. I could see a, it being useful as an API, something that newsrooms could integrate into their disaster coverage. Right? I could imagine uh, a chart on a homepage that says, here's how many people are still in direct housing from, you know, our local recent, um, hurricane, things like that. Uh, a, I could imagine putting a kind of more useful interactive interface on top of the data set so that if people want to do historical analyses or explorations, browsing, um, there's a sort of approachable way to do that that doesn't require any data analysis, let's say skills or computer programming. So those are a few of the things I have in mind, but I'm very much open to suggestions from people here, from people elsewhere. Thanks for that. And and also the fact that you get a chance to um, to go ahead and allow folks to fork your, 
your add-on and then build absolutely that. please use the add-on let me know um how you'd like to see it develop in the future right now it's fairly bare bones i think there's some the add-on uh repository page itself has some ideas for how i'd like to make it more powerful if those excite you or you feel like you know one of those features is the barrier to you uh using it let me know and that will motivate me to uh focus on getting that out sooner Right. Um, okay. I've asked all that I had prepared, and I know there are some questions in the chat. I think I can now actually see the chat. Um, and maybe, oh, let me see. Um, seeing a note here from somebody in the group that could you, Tom, um, He's currently asking, is there a place to go ahead and talk about data visualization? Um, maybe some clarification about what specifically about data visualization related that you want? Yeah, so um, um, this, this the technical part of, of getting the data and putting it into the cloud is, is hard for me to digest. I work with people who have your kinds of skills and can place documents in, in some kind of tool, you know, and then extracts, you know, whatever you're looking for, certain numbers, you know, you're trying to get some totals or some of the kinds of patterns. But what about something like Spotfire or, or some kind of GIS mapping tool that's, that, that works nicely with something like a, a data cloud? So you said, look, I want a map of Chicago. So grab me the shape file for Chicago. And Chicago has 50 wards. That's, political districts. So I'd like to see those, please. And then drop in the data points, whatever they are, you know, FEMA, FEMA permits or whatever else you're trying to track. You know what I'm saying? Is there some set of hands that would be able to noodle that? In the context of document cloud or the data liberation project or something else? Well, uh, well you're talking about the document cloud today. But just just generally, in, in, in just general, you know, when you when you when you've liberated the data, whatever, however you've done that, in, in terms of a, a thousand PDFs or whatever it is that you've secured, you put them into some spreadsheet, perhaps, and then you know you're back to the say, how do I show this? How do I tell the story of the trends over time or space, geography, or what have you? So that's the storytelling part, I guess, that's going to be consumed by your by your readers, your users. Um, I guess maybe that's like the next chapter. I, I, okay, I see where you're going. Um, I can speak for the Data Liberation Project. Andre, maybe you have perspective from Document Cloud. The Data Liberation Project, um, in my mind, is much more about getting data into the hands of people who want to do those sorts of things. Journalists, advocates, uh, you know, un independent citizens, um, residents, uh, policymakers, what have you. Uh, getting them more well-documented, uh, well-structured data um, that they, they then have the liberty to analyze, visualize, and so on, however they want. However, because I think you're right that a lot of people, you know, a spreadsheet um, often doesn't tell a story, doesn't speak to them. I think a lot of the work of the data liberation project, it might not be making, you know, the let's say the map for Chicago, for example, or um, kind of full-on kind of journalism projects in that sense, uh, but um, to get people, I think it's important to get people to a level of comfort with the data set, so that they understand what's in it, how it can be used. And some of the work that I'll be doing through the Data Liberation Project will be about um, giving people points of entry, let's say, into data sets that make them more usable. And that could be a map, that could be an interactive website, and so on. I think that's I think that's a similar answer that I would give. I think it's I think it, for for these types of projects, it's been about making sure that the that the information is available so that it can be analyzed 
and then be and then be used by other organizations and then be available for support to help folks figure out how best to present that. Um, I don't know if I, th I think some of that too is related to having people have conversations and work with each other and figure out how to encourage more collaboration so that you can push these so that you can push these efforts to that next level. And now that I can see the chat, I would say that there are tons of people here who will probably be enjoying opportunities to work with each other and moving stuff forward. Um, but yeah, I think that is something that I'm also interested in seeing Tom um, and Jeremy, just the idea of what else is possible once you get this data. Um, what, cause, because what you get from one project can then be layered on other projects if they're public in document cloud and then seeing what else might be able to help you better tell that story. Um, and, and then Tom just goes and drops a great example in, in that chat. Um, so thank you very much for doing that. Um, I, I think it's good... interesting too to note that Jeremy started with a visualization from that New York Times article and was wondering where the data came from and realizing that uh, to get that visualization, there was a lot of pain there. Um, I think it's really valuable to understand that um, that data extraction and pipelining process can be some of the most painful parts of the of the process. Um, actually getting it in an accessible format, um, getting it all in one place, um, and then being able to extract information from it. Uh, that that is in and of itself um, half of the half of the journey for sure, um, if not more. And then uh, as we work as we work to continue to work on add-ons uh, at Document Cloud and 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 you know other projects, uh, the other half uh, would be the the visualization of that revisualization of that information or um, something like that. So I found it interesting in this case that it was kind of the the reverse engineering of the. Uh, of the uh, visualization that was in the article. Well said. Great. Um, thank you for that question, Tom. Um, um, does anybody else want to, does anyone else have questions? I think. Um, let's go ahead and throw them in the chat and I can call on you and um, I'll put your, well, Put your hand up and Sonia will tell me that I can call on you and we can go from there. Seeing none. What other um, kind of projects are you are you looking to include under the data liberation project umbrella? Um, you mentioned the FEMA housing reports, but what what else is it on your stack currently? Um, um yeah there if you go to the data liberation um project website here i'll just share my screen very briefly again uh you can see the foias um that we're filing uh you know foia is a slow process at times although we have gotten um this epa risk management program database and are getting close to releasing it publicly um that has been kind of our first uh, FOIA win, let's say. So this is a database of um, basically five-year reports that every facility in the U.S. has to submit to the EPA uh, if they handle or process extremely hazardous substances. Um, it includes information about those substances, about their accident history, and things like that. So um, that is that is something I've been spending a good amount of time on lately, and will hopefully be out soon. Also, because FOIA generally takes, you know, is a little slower. I've been working on um, a few other scraping projects, and one thing I am realizing is that uh, this FEMA project will be a good. I think will inform a lot of the other scraping work I do because it is all too common that you have a set of PDFs that are um, sort of imprisoning useful data and uh, they are usefully, let's say, liberated both programmatically, extracting structured data, but also getting them into something like Document Cloud. And for now, Document Cloud is you know, the solution I've been using. 
um, so that they can be more easily searched. And then, for example, Michael noted in the chat, uh, you know, uh, you can apply entity extraction. You can do all sorts of other things with these documents that once were sort of um, inert and not very useful, but you know, once they're in a structured thing, a platform like Document Cloud, you can start to do some interesting things with them. Thank you. A um, couple, couple questions from the chat, just so we can get them on the recording. Um, what format does the crawler create? But what file format does the crawler create for Document Cloud? It is PDF format, correct? Sorry, the crawler. What? What format is the is the add-on looking for? Is it looking for mm. PDF format? So the yeah, I'll, they're right. Um, the the add-on, let's say, is looking for an RSS feed, which is sort of its own format. It's technically XML, but a specific kind of uh, structure of XML. In it, it's looking for a link to a PDF. Um, it's then uploading that PDF to uh, to document cloud. Um, I don't, I think that hopefully answers the question. I think it does. Um, okay. I will say, you know, one of the kind of to do's or the future improvements was, I believe that document cloud has support for a few other file types and, you know, probably good to add support for those. And also, um, to provide a little flexibility in where the add-on is looking within the RSS feed for those PDF links, right? Um, and so, and, and so it, and so it will skip non-PDF files for the purposes of this particular. It currently, process. it's a great question. That's probably room for improvement. Um, I believe if you tried to give it something that wasn't a PDF, it would just not. Yeah, it would skip it. Um, but if you have an interest in this and doing, you know, in kind of expanding or or helping to define the functionality definitely reach out to me um i'm the only person in the world with my name my email address is on my website uh i'm very uh, easy to get in touch with um i do see now i'm going through the a few of the chat items lisa your question about rmp um i could talk all day with you about access issues with the rmp data uh definitely reach out and um I'm interested to hear your uh, your experience. And what is RMP for those that are Oh, watching? sorry. That is the EPA's risk management program uh, data, the data we got via uh, FOIA. Thank you. And I was going to I was going to reference the fact that we were going to put the ant we were going to go ahead and list uh, a link to the file types in there. Um, there are 70 plus file types currently accepted by Document Cloud. Um, so it should be, as Sanyan is pointing out in the chat, um, it should be possible to allow support for those file types down the road. Um, what else do you see yourself doing moving forward? In the right now with the data liberation project, the exciting phase is you know I spent a lot of time in the beginning just setting the kind of groundwork and starting to file FOIAs and understanding the kind of general strategy. And now that we're actually getting data back or you know extracting data and uh, publishing data, uh, for me the exciting next phase, the part I've always kind of really enjoyed in journalism work is the collaboration. So. Um, I'm excited to start working with journalists and other folks to find ways for them to use the data that uh, that we are liberating. That is going to be exciting as somebody who loves digging into collaborations. Um, so I guess a follow-up question that, that just came in is, so you're not doing the analysis yourself right now, or are you? Interesting. So uh, it's a good question, Austin, and kind of, um, I'm not sure it's a binary yes, no answer, because in order, I feel very strongly that in order to truly liberate data, you have to make it um, actually useful to other people. Uh, and I think making data useful, in my experience, having worked with other people's data sets, documentation uh, is essential. 
And in order to write good documentation to really understand the data set, you do have to do some analysis. You have to understand what are the data quality issues, what are, you know, do the numbers actually add up? Like if they said there were 90,000 submissions, are there really, you know, in, you know, these uh, risk management program submissions, are there really 90,000, things like that. So definitely there's some analysis involved. Um, I think it's impossible to do this work well without that. But I am trying to, as I say, like not take too big a bite from the apple. Um, you know, I want to encourage other people to do the analysis and um, partly because I have limited bandwidth and partly because I don't want the data liberation project to sort of suck the, uh, the air out of the room. Uh, it's a mixed metaphors. Um, I'm not, for example, uh, like doing a big investigative analysis that I'm then publishing through the data liberation project. So the idea is to kind of help seed the, seed the opportunities for collaboration. Exactly. I'm reading this the same way Austin is right now. Um, comes down to the idea of time. How much time do you have in order to go ahead and do yeah. some of the analysis? Um, do you feel as though, I'm, think... I'm gonna paraphrase. I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase yeah. the best I can. Ken, do you feel as though you have enough time to do um, analysis? Um, and do you feel as though people are going to, um, do you, how are you going to find people who would see the same things that you would see in that initial analysis right. and trying uh, to get them involved in the process? Yeah, I don't want necessarily to dictate what the things, the right things to see are, but I do want to make sure, I think as Austin notes, that um, people are understanding the data correctly, that they're understanding the structure, that they're understanding um, the various caveats. And so I am putting, you know, a, I would say now a majority of the time into uh, doing this documentation um, and trying to get it to a place where, of course, I think Austin's absolutely right. There will be a lot of people asking, hopefully, in a, actually in the ideal world, there will be a lot of people asking for assistance understanding the data. And I think a big challenge of the data liberation project will be feeling will be about, you know, how what's the best way to serve that need. Um, there's certainly the written documentation, and that's uh, you know my personal instincts lean toward just investing deeply in written documentation. Um, but also I think I'll be offering some kind of webinars, hands-on trainings, uh, office hours, things like that. So it is really just part of, it's part of getting the, part of getting the process started really more, more certainly yeah. as well. So getting people into a position where they feel comfortable using the data. Um, I'm trying to keep this. Um, and I think it's also important. Yeah. And it's the idea of how it applies down the road. Because as Michael is mentioning in the chat, uh, Michael Morrissey, our, our, our CEO, um, the idea of simplifying no code integrations um it's in that process as well in terms of, of being able to kind of document outputs for an rss feed be able to find that um and i think that's something is is more um is what i just thought of here the ability to go ahead and fork these projects allow you to kind of play with some of the issues related to how people can use it because it's not a one size fits all solution, correct? Like in terms of how you would approach developing the add-on to make it so that it's, it, it isn't so someone can just throw something in and it'll produce the exact results you want currently. It would really be a case of figuring out how, the, how you can fork a particular add-on and then figuring out what what you need to do, and maybe adding additional functionality to to an existing add-on to make it more flexible. Does that make sense? 
as a leading question, Jeremy. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I, I understand the topic. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, the ability, I think, for lack of a better thing, the, the, the importance of this, or at least we've been able to kind of go down the rabbit hole a little bit, is that the opportunity is there to add additional functionality down the road, and you feel as though that is possible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, I, um, I'm a big fan of open source programming in general, um, the, you know, the ability for people to see what you're doing, to adapt what you're doing, to learn from their adaptations, um, to see software improve over time, thanks to community contributions. Um, I think, you know, the, uh, there's definitely the possibility for that. And, um, I think the approach document cloud is taking with add-ons, making them effectively code repositories, uh, is smart. And I think a useful way to encourage that sort of iteration and improvement. Cool. And are there any additional questions for Jeremy? And for those who can't see this chat, because you probably won't be able to, I will agree with with what Austin just put in the chat is that Jeremy is doing amazing work. No, oh, thank great you. To kind of get in and <laughs> and and see someone leveraging the le leveraging the, the 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 possibilities as a result of of add on functionality. I'm gonna. So seeing no more questions, I could also just ask, is there anything I've forgotten to ask? Um, no, I think, I mean, I would say overall, uh, you know, I am someone who, especially in my professional work in newsrooms was uh, incredibly reluctant to adopt not necessarily new technologies, but um, to depend on third-party platforms. Because you know, if you've been working in any space related to uh, data and technology, these platforms are, they're like you know they pop up and they disappear, and they pop up and they disappear. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Melly, <laughs> um, and uh, you don't want to be stuck in a position where like you've invested so much of your your pipeline or your approach in a website or platform, whatever, that isn't going to exist three years from now. Um, I have made, you know, in the course of this work, a few exceptions because there are some tools um, that have both proven they have staying power and are legitimately worth depending on. And GitHub and Document Cloud are two of them. So I feel like you know that sort of that combination to me is powerful and sort of um, that hesitations I would have, for example, like buying into an infrastructure for some other platform. Um, I didn't really feel here, and uh, I appreciate the work you all have done to sort of um, I wouldn't say guarantee. I don't think there are any guarantees in life like this, but to try to uh, make sure that Document Cloud exists as a public service for a very long time. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving us some time and answering those questions for us this afternoon. I'm going to go ahead and formally end the event here and thank everybody who went ahead and joined us and those who are watching us uh, via YouTube or elsewhere. <laughs>